Hello and welcome to the Horn One Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, consider signing up for the Patreon. There you get ad-free content, early access, exclusive episodes, and monthly supporter hangouts. You can find it at patreon.com slash the Juan on Juan podcast. If you don't like the subscription-based models, there are other ways of supporting the show that are linked in the description. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy this episode. They said it was forbidden. They said it was dangerous. They were right. Introducing the paranoid American homunculus owner's manual. Dive into the arcane, into the hidden corners of the occult. This isn't just a comic. It's a hidden tome of supernatural power. All original artwork illustrating the groundbreaking research of Juan Ayala, one of the only living homunculologists of our time. Learn how to summon your own homunculus, an enigma wrapped in the fabric of reality itself, their power at your fingertips, their existence, your secret. Explore the mysteries of the Aristotelian, the spiritual, the Paracelsian, the Crowleyan homunculus. Ancient knowledge lost to time, now unearthed in this forbidden tale. This comic book holds truths not meant for the light of day. Knowledge that was buried, feared, and shunned. Are you ready to uncover the hidden, the paranoid American homunculus owner's manual, not for the faint of heart? Available now from Paranoid American. Get your copy at tjojp.com or paranoidamerican.com today. Welcome to the One on One Podcast with your host, Juan Ayala. I personally think that what happens is all of us, we've got influences. It's stuff that we came across. It's stuff that we've absorbed. We all have a variety of influences and they affect our own work. I think this is a crucial thing that it becomes, if you like, transformed, distilled, if you like, by one's own experience into something else and, and and that something else will in its turn be taken by others as one influence among amongst many and they'll distill their own work from that i think that's how it goes personally Welcome back to another episode of the Juan Juan Podcast. I'm your host as always, Juan. Make sure to follow the show on social media at the Juan Juan Podcast, tjojp.com. You can find everything on there. And today I am joined by Mario from Symbolic Studies as a co-host. And we have Michael Staley with us today, a very interesting guy. Michael, welcome and welcome, Mario. How are you both? Hello. Yeah, thank you very much. Very pleased to be here. I'm fine. Thanks very much. I'm great, man. Thanks for having me. You excited, bro? Yeah, yeah, for sure. This is going to be an interesting one. Michael, before we start diving deep into the mob zone, no pun intended, can you let the people know where they can find your work and if you have any websites, any social media you want to plug? Uh, well, uh, basically, uh, as far as websites go, it's really just a Starfire publishing website. Um, yeah. Which is... Um, yeah, um, they can contact me at uh, admin at starfirepublishing.co.uk. Um, but um, I mean, the easiest way, frankly, to um, get into the Starfire website is to go via a, br- via a browser such as um, Google. Oh, I see you brought it up. You brought it up. Yeah. There's a website, starfirepublishing.co.uk. That's it, yeah. Do you ship to the U.S., Michael? Uh, uh, yes, I do, but uh, to JD Holmes, who distributes it 
uh, within the USA and within Canada. Okay, awesome. All right. I'll keep that in mind. So always- That's why I purchased uh, a couple of my Kenneth Grant books, and they were fantastic to work with. And so... Mm-hmm. Out the gate, just want to say uh, thank you for making uh, his work available because I was a little discouraged at the beginning when I was getting interested in his stuff that some of his older copies, the original copies, were expensive. And then I found out that J.D. Holmes does carry his material. I called them up. They're real people. (laughs) answered my questions, and I got it delivered in a timely manner. So um, recommend people, if they're interested in Grant, to, to go through him in the U.S. Yeah, I'll be ordering some. I have I have PDF copies. And by the way, SymbolicStudies.com to find Mario. He is not new to the channel. Everyone knows where they can find him. And because of you, Mario, is that I got... I had told you I had some grant work that I wanted to dive into. And it was you that really kind of was like, dude, there's a lot in there. It's kind of dense. It's more advanced stuff. There is a lot of, of this typhonian oto words and and terms that i don't understand there's a lot of things in there that i don't understand the lima etc etc so the thing about grant is he'll slow you down when you're reading grant you can't speed read you can't try Mm. and you can't be superficial with it you have to take the actual time to sit down it's not something you pop in an audio book and you go okay this is no no you have to sit down because he'll slow you down you'll be trying to speed read and then there'll be something that'll snag you and it's like whoa 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 let, let me what did he just say? So you have to go back. And that's what's drawn me in. And Michael, to whenever I have a guest on, I do research on them. I listen to other interviews that they've done. And shout out to Ken from the Sitting Now podcast, who did, who's done, I think, a couple interviews with you that are excellent. You can check them out. So shout out to Ken. Uh, Michael, but people that don't know you or don't know your work, can you tell us a little bit about you and how you even got involved with somebody like Grant? And then you uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, sure. Um, basically, I've been interested in the occult uh, for as long as I can remember. So virtually all my life. I mean, obviously, when I was a, when I when I was a wee kid, it was stuff like ghosts, etc., etc., etc. And then round about eleven, twelve, uh, I started to sort of get into. I went through various phases. I was interested in um, Eastern mysticism for a while, spiritualism for a while. Um, and then round about the age of 18, um, it, was, it, was, it, it was actually now the late 60s. And what had happened was that Alistair Crowley had died um, in obscurity in 1947 and remained in obscurity effectively. But then um, the hippie explosion of, of, of 66, 67, um, it it triggered a huge interest in um, in Eastern mysticism. And um, with that, uh, it, it triggered also an interest in what you might call the homegrown varieties, um, you know, not just mysticism, but magic, the occult generally. Um, and um, somehow it was Crowley's time. And, and so there was a sudden upsurge of interest in Crowley. And I began to take uh, a, a huge interest in him as well at that time. And um, I absorbed his stuff over several years and was, you know, p- quite, you know, probably what, you know, you might sort of in wilder reaches of imagination regard me as a Crowleyite, I suppose. Um, and then, to be honest, it got up. It all got a little bit. I wouldn't. I wouldn't use the word boring, but um, Crowley stuff was being reprinted, and most of the reprints were coming from America um, into the UK. Um, and then after a while, people started writing about Crowley, but it it was all always pretty much the same thing, um, and there didn't seem to be a lot further you could go. And then um, in 1972, uh, Kenneth Grant's first book of the Typhonian trilogies, The Magical Revival, came out. And I read that and found it found it hard going um, at first, but it was a breath of fresh air because it, it was something new. And then after that, there was um, Alistair Crowley and the Hidden God. Now, I spent... I spent I spent vast uh, tracts of time, a year at a time, uh, living on a kibbutz um, in Israel, and in one of my um, 
sojourns back in the United, back in the UK, um, a friend of mine uh, was in uh, what, for legal reasons, we might, we, we might refer to as Grant's Order. I, I'm referring, of course, to the Typhoon Unit O. And, um, and so um, I embarked on a probation ship um, and uh, uh, was accepted January 1976. I saw quite a lot of Kenneth Grant in the throughout the 1980s. Um, and then um, I moved to London in 1987. And uh, saw uh, a lot more, a lot more of Kenneth Grant. Um, also, I'd launched uh, a magazine or journal called Starfire by this time, which was largely orientated towards Kenneth's work. To be, to be honest, um, and then just kind of gradually, I became uh, Kenneth's right hand man, as it were. Um, I started, I became his publisher in the late nineties. Um, which which meant that I was absorbing his work um, a lot more. And um, his last book in the Typhoon New Trilogies, The Ninth Arch, appeared in 2002. And thereafter, um, we published um, things like novels, uh, compilations of mystical articles called At the Feet of the Guru, um, and then, uh, well, basically, when he died in 2011, um, I, I just I just worked with Steffi Grant on um, reprinting his work and getting getting it back into print and make it, making it making it available um, again, and just carried on from there. Really, I, the reason why I do it, um, actually, as I used to explain to Steffi, was I I sort of wasn't publishing it because um, I was doing a, a, a sort of, if you like, favour to my uh, deceased friend. I was publishing it because I find Kenneth Grant's work to be the most profound body of work that I've ever come across. And if that wasn't the case, I wouldn't put all my, I wouldn't put so much of my uh, time and energy into it, basically. Um, we recently reprinted over the last few years we've sort of reprinted the books again uh this time branching out into paperback and i was very taken aback by how, how much how much the interest in kenneth grant had grown in the last few years i mean in the 1980s not so much um even really when i was producing the second editions uh in the years after kenneth's death uh again not so much but i was really taken aback where the first the first book that I, uh, I i reprinted in in the paperback edition was the magical revival and i was really taken aback by the demand for it very gratified as well of course anyway that's where i am today really. and to to ask one of mario's questions right we usually don't stick to a script around here but in your opinion, why has Grant's work increased in popularity in, in recent years? Why is there such, again, another revival of his work? Why do you think that is? I think, really, it's because um, more and more people are realizing how, how, much, how much stuff there is in there, uh, how profound uh, the work is. Um, one, of the things, one of the things that I like about running Starfire Publishing um, is is getting emails from people and getting orders from people. And um, I also run a, a Kenneth Grant page um, on Facebook. And I think the area of Grant that touches people the most at the moment is uh, what you might refer to as imagination and creativity. Um, I think I think that it's a quality of Grant's work really that's coming through in the same way, in the same way uh, I guess that uh, the rise from from obscurity of Crowley, uh, you know, due to the counterculture of the mid and late and the mid and late sixties, meant really that 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 the quality was out. Uh, I do feel personally that uh, a body of work is a living thing. And it can just kind of wait for 
it can just wait for when the time is fertile, a bit like, say, um, a bit like, say, mushroom mycelium being underground and staying underground for a long period of time. And then a farmer might plough up a field that's not ploughed up for quite a long time. And all of a sudden, mushrooms sprout up. I heard you talk about, uh, before Grant had passed, that he had kind of given you the task to not only reprint his work, but also continue his work and develop it even further, right? Because I, from, from my research into the occult and all these magical orders, you see how occultists prior, they take, uh, you know, occultists, they take work from prior occultists, such as Crowley yeah, and taking the work of John D as an Enochian, the OTO used all that. And I mean, you can see how they adapt that, that system to fit their needs to run their operations and i think that i think magic i think whatever that force is 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 like like the force right in star wars where you can tap into it and you can use it for good or you can use it for evil right some people right crowley the wickedest man in 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 the world or whatever he's he's called right the the b666 Uh, but some people would say that he used it for evil right that's up for debate but I think that whatever system you're using, you can adapt it. And I think that's also what set Grant aside. And and correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't that what also turned Crowley off from Grant, that he was then incorporating these other aspects into his work, such as the Lovecraft? No, stuff? Not, re- no not Crowley, because um, that would be too early, frankly. I mean, Crowley died in 47, and... Kenneth didn't really get going uh, until, I mean, the big, uh, big. He'd been interested in tantra for quite a long time, and it, it, indeed, he had discussed it um, with Crowley while he was down at Netherwood for a f- uh, for a few months as Crowley's secretary. Um, but the the kind of big thing for Grant was coming across Massey's work in 1948 in the British Museum. I think it's fair to say that Kenneth hadn't really got going by the time that Crowley died. Um, I think it's true to say that that Crowley's successor, Carl Germer, took exception to um, what he considered was a bit too much mixing on Kenneth's part and actually expelled him from the OTO in 1955. Mm. Okay, yeah, I knew there was somebody that he turned off from his work mm-hmm. because of these things that he was incorporating. But that's what's drawn me to Grant, right? Like this little crafty aspect to it. Yeah, I would just like to return to something that you said a few minutes ago, actually, um, about, about sort of people taking different things. I personally think that the... the what happens is uh, all of us, we've got influences. It's stuff that we came across. It's stuff um, that we've absorbed. Uh, we all have a variety of influences um, and they affect our own work. But, and I think, this is, I think this is a crucial uh, thing that it becomes, if you like, transformed, distilled, if you like, by one's own experience into something else. And, and, and that something else will in its turn be taken by others um, as one influence among, amongst many, and they'll distill their own work from that. Uh, I think that's how it goes personally. Juan. Yeah, just to kind of piggyback on what you mentioned, Juan, regarding H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. So that was kind of my in. Um, when I found out that there was a Lovecraftian sort of magical tradition that had developed over the decades i felt like i needed to learn way more about that and i became immediately interested and uh, i think it's fascinating that there is uh the lovecraft influence and then in pop culture which juan and i we've talked about at length you know there's been a massive influence of uh, lovecraftian films and and uh, literature and things like that over the years and so to see grant's popularity rise and then also the lovecraft sort of um 
mythos really influenced pop culture in a huge, huge way, which I still think a lot of people don't really understand unless they kind of dive into this material. I think it's fascinating. And uh, also, Juan, to your point, there is a Crowleyan uh, Thelemic bookshop locally in Portland, Oregon. And they have a lot of great reference material there, lots of tarot decks, things like that. And I went in there and I thought if any place around me had uh, Kenneth Grant stuff, they would. And I brought him up and he kind of scoffed at his work. And I'm like, oh, well, what's going on with that? And he said it was because of the Lovecraftian influence that he couldn't really jive with that. And he didn't really understand it. And he thought he was reaching and he went too far. And I was like, oh, that's really fascinating. That's why I'm interested. (laughs) I think there's something here that is worth diving into. So depending on who you are, it's either going to turn you off or it's going to turn you on and you're going to want to know more. Yeah, I must admit. I must admit, in the early days, and when I say early days, um, I don't know, all, all the way up to uh, all, all, all the way up to the late nineteen eighties, I I didn't really, I wasn't really that interested in Lovecraft. What I mean by that is, um, I'd read his stories in the late sixties, you know, and found them really, really interesting, really very interesting indeed, but. Um, I wasn't that much interested in what you might call the Cthulhu Gnosis or uh, what you might call uh, the Cthulhu Pantheon. Um, and indeed, I can remember as late, as, as I say, the, the late 80s, saying, saying to a friend of mine, um, you know, Paul, the irrational has never, has, has, has never attracted me. And kind of like right from that, I, after that, my my life gradually changed but my own view on the lovecraft connection uh really is um i take grant's point entirely that lovecraft being a very very sensitive person um was very receptive very receptive to um shall we say the the strata, the wide strata of of awareness of consciousness, of which we are really in the shallows, actually. And there is a really, really interesting uh, book that Arkham House brought out many years ago now called Dreams and Fancies. And in there, um, there is love. There is a dream recounted by Lovecraft, and then and then following that, there is a story. Um, of which the dream was the base, and it's fascinating because you can see you can see that in some cases it, it's almost word for word. In other cases, it's just kind of inspired. It's just been a few words, and it's just just inspired. Um, you know, a whole lot more. And on on your right, because this is a topic that I talk about a lot, right? The imagination, you mentioned imagination earlier and creativity, almost like a sort of force that's working in the background and how right some ideas, some universes even maybe can lay dormant in the minds of people, right? Some would say, or uh, what? what's your opinion as to it being from an outside source? Because one of the common themes that you, that I've, I've noticed in all of these works even crowley's work right the the book of of lies is that it's uh you talk a lot about transmissions i've heard you talk about as well where they're getting sort of downloads from would it be outside sources outside entities can you elaborate a little bit on that of this idea of getting sure sure i can um I mean, a couple of minutes ago, you mentioned the possibility um, that imagination, and by that I don't mean, you know, the stuff that's in our heads and so forth, but say much, much deeper and further away, uh, what you might call a collective imagination, if you like. And it's a collective imagination that actually that actually inspires creativity, uh, et cetera. And I think it's not a passive thing. I think it's an active thing. Lovecraft talks somewhere in one of his letters um, about, 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 about space pressing inwards and, and pressing inwards in, in, into our consciousness, into our, our awareness. And um, I think that, yeah, I think imagination is something active, not so much the, what you might call, uh, 
the shallower reaches of imagination around around the individual, but going further out, and I I think I think they're active, and um, and they inspire creative they inspire creativity. I mean, that's not to say that we are mere um, channels or mediums for something else, because that's just not true. Because we shape. You know, the artist, the artist picks up inspiration and creates something from that inspiration. You know, that they don't just actually uh, do as they're instructed, as it were. Yes. Anyway, does that answer that? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm with you on that. Because cause, H.P. Lovecraft is one of those guys that, right, he was taking inspiration, how you're saying. And I think it's, there's one of these words that's like... I think it's either obsession or inspiration or enthusiasm where it's where you're being essentially possessed by a higher source. But he took a lot of his inspiration from his dreams, almost as if something was I've always said that something was trying to contact him. And through how you're saying these works of literature that are alive, he was able to birth into existence this entire mythos that then took on a mind of its own because it it right memetics it spread throughout culture it shaped culture i mean they call him the don't they call him the father of horror or something like that hb lovecraft he's very influential uh, i don't know. i've 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 never come across that moniker to be honest you know uh, father of horror some i mean he was very influential to horror i mean maybe not perhaps the father of horror but i think i've seen that put somewhere along my my readings uh, because he was really right that he introduced this idea of cosmicism, this idea that you're a speck of nothingness and there is uh, there are entities and and uh, things outside of your or of space and time, essentially, that are much bigger than you. And right. The elder gods, the elder things. And I mean, this is this is something that I've always thought about. I was like, is there things trying again? You can make the debate if they're good or they're evil, because, I mean, that's always going to be up for debate. But it's like these things trying to break through into our reality, into our dimension that exists in this. I don't know if you have ever come across Henry Corbin's work, who was a contemporary of Carl Jung. Carl Jung. I've read it. No, I've heard. I know the name quite well. The Mundus Imaginalis. You ever heard of that? I've never read it. So the Mundus Imaginalis is a concept of it's this this autonomous world right that exists between reality and and non-reality right like the imagination space that is autonomous now the thing that i've always thought about is does it exist be, uh, does it exist collectively for everyone and we can all tap into that mundus imaginalis or does every single individual person have their own mundus imaginalis in which they're able to extract things in and out of that because there are Angela Voss, which is an esotericist, she writes about how there's technologies to tap into this Mundus Imaginalis, scrying being one of them. You have Edward Kelly and John Dee who were doing these Enochian seances, essentially, and they were tapping into these other realms and extracting knowledge from, again, entities outside of space and time that were re revealing things to them that they were like, listen, if we, we have to do everything backwards, I've read the magical journals of John D and Edward Kelly. We have to do everything backwards, right? And letter by letter, because if we even utter, right, the, the entities on the other side, if we even utter these words, these letters, these strings of letters, we will quite literally summon, right, the guardian elemental of that aether or whatever it is. And it could quite literally destroy reality as you know it. So again, was that all just, a shared collective hallucination or were they truly tapping into this other realm reality uh, dimension whatever you want to call it. and that's something that in my research that's always always fascinated me and that's why i think i'm drawn to grant and his work with lovecraft because it is interdimensional it is this at right the mauve zone the universe b where you're able to go there and i mean he talks about this in in, in his literature and i think Right. Uh, Grant has even talked about how uh, to get a little woo woo that he claimed response. Well, I don't know if he claimed responsibility, but the idea of the UFO phenomenon being because of the works of Crowley, right? You have Parsons, you have L. Ron Hubbard, all those guys in 1947 where they were doing activities that could have opened up portals for things to come through. 
Mm-hmm. Any any thoughts on that, Mario or Michael? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's possible. I think I think it's highly probable. I mean, to wind back to um, a remark that you made um, a little earlier in that conversation about the possibility. Um, you know, are we contacting something that's there or have we each got um, that area? I I personally go, I personally go to the former, but that's because I'm an inviting and I think that individuality is, is surface deep, skin deep. Um, so I don't think it's possible for, uh, f- for us kind of to be, um, all of us to be a bunch of ultimates, if you if you know what I mean. I mean, I mean, obviously, I, I wouldn't discount it because one thing one thing I've learned over um, over the years in my occult career, if you like, is that um, somehow on the basis of what you experience and what you read, you're continually setting up, if you like, models. Um, pe- people call them paradigms, don't they, uh, etc. And the brain seems to do that automatically. You know, you can't not do it. Um, but I've also learned, I've also learned that sort of everything, every, every model, every paradigm that I've had has been has been disproved, has been displaced, has been redeveloped by something else. So now I regard everything as working theory. So hence. As I said, being inviting, I would kind of discount uh, each of us, you know, having what you might call the ultimate, etc. But I mean, I'd be a very foolish man, um, based on my experience so far, with paradigm after paradigm after paradigm dissolving away. I'd be very silly to rule that out. Mm. Yeah, no, I'm reminded of uh, kind of the saying that uh, the map isn't necessarily the terrain. Right. So no matter what model you have, it doesn't match the actual thing that it's trying to represent. Right. Um, So it reminds me of uh, the concept of a a simulation or simulacra of something that does exist. Um, And then, Juan, I was going to mention, I think you maybe are referring to um, Lovecraft being the father of modern horror, that the the modern sort of prefix to that Uh, is kind of important, which is interesting I, I believe I could be wrong or mistaken on that one, but uh, the fact that he's the father of modern horror and the way he is using, you know, um, the imagery that he kind of like gravitates towards and, and these different deities and things like that, um, he's pulling things out from like a really, really ancient primordial kind of place. So I just think that's really fascinating. There you go. It's fascinating that he's the father of modern horror, uh, but the vehicle he's using or the tool he's using. Um, are these primordial deities, these really ancient old ones, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some people would say that he was drawing his inspiration from from like these Sumerian gods and other other external sources that he was getting, like, right, these concepts of things that exist that are that are beyond comprehension. And then that is also a concept that because I know Grant and Spar were were associates at one point and that's what drew me to the idea of of spars work right where uh, where it's it's chaos right it's chaos but it's not what people think it to be it's organization beyond your comprehension it's so organized so structured that you can't even begin to comprehend and wrap your mind around it right almost like a like a it's like a paradoxical or a chaos magical yeah and, and that's one of the the aspects to uh, chaos magic that also intrigues me where it's very fluid and they throw out the whole ceremonial stuff and it's like no you know you focus on the intent you do the do you don't have to worry about everything else which uh, do you have anything on that because i know you told you when we were emailing me you told me you at first did not uh we're not interested in spar's work but then after seeing this portrait that you saw the portrait the self-portrait with rodent which i'm going to pull up here uh, something sparked in you and you started to research Austin Osman Spar? This is the... Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I did. I mean, um, I, I used to I used to visit Kenneth 
and uh, he had quite a few spares on his wall and so forth. And it just com- it just completely left me cold. And then this particular picture here, um, just um, I don't know why, but I fell in love with it, and um, it just made me go back and look at spare again. And so I gradually took more and more interest in spare, not not just his pictures, but um, his work as well. And his early written work is quite heavy going. The Book of Pleasure, yes. the focus of life. The Book of Pleasure, especially, it's it's partly because of his love of obscure words um, and strange syntax uh, and even stranger punctuation. But uh, it's worth persisting with it because there's a lot there. There's a lot there. And um, I personally think that Spare was a bigger influence on 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 Kenneth's work than Crowley, actually. Um, I do. In, in a way, it's not surprising, of course, because his his relationship with the two was very, very different. I mean, uh, he he spent basically a few months uh, with Crowley, but it was a very formal relationship. He said to me one day, uh, Crowley wasn't the sort of person that you could kind of clap on the shoulder, um, that sort of thing. It was actually much, much more formal. Whereas whereas with Spare, he and Steffi um, used to go out pub crawling, for instance, um, in the late 40s and the early 50s, for instance. You know, it was... Um, it was much more informal. And it was also an entirely different relationship too because when when Kenneth and Steffi met Spare, he was writing another book. And he, 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 I believe I'm right in saying he never had a typewriter. He certainly didn't know how to type. So straight away, uh, Grant offered to type up the material for him, give it back to him, double-spaced, and then he could just edit it and so forth and uh, and kind of soon uh kenneth was making suggestions you know um um about you know about possible words to substitute etc 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 um and they used to help spare out a lot with his exhibitions and so on. but more to the point more to the point um spare left his uh spare left his written work um to kenneth you know they eventually published that in the late 1990s as uh as zoss speaks but uh i mean when i say when i say that i think spare was a bigger influence on his work i, I mean sure there's there's much much more reference to um to crowley and to crowley in terms throughout the whole work you know because i mean uh, Kenneth, as a young man, was overawed by Crowley, and, and I don't think he he ever quite got away from that. Um, but I just think that just think that Spare had much more influence on his work. Mario, you wanted to add something? You know, uh, well, I'm I'm just kind of curious because to me that's kind of uh, just to think of him helping him out with his works and and you know typing it for him and all of that. Uh, what was Grant's uh, writing process like? Do you have any insights into that with how he would compile a work together? And kind of uh, related to this, I'm just curious too, how you know far into his writing sort of career did he realize he was developing this Typhonian trilogies? Uh, was that a, something that he knew early on or did it just kind of become that? Okay, um, I'll deal with the latter first, actually. Sure. Um, the Typhonian trilogies. Uh, what happened? What happened was in about the mid sixties, he started working with John Simons to reprint Crowley's work, and at the same time, uh, Kenneth Kenneth started writing um, a study of Crowley's work, and you know, a study of Crowley's system, if you like, and. That kind of started out with the working title of 666, I think it was. But then but then um in the late sixties, uh I think it was a, suge- a suggestion from Steffi, but he hit upon Alice Crowley and the Hidden God. <clears throat> so um then <clears throat> he sent it to Muller. This would have been <clears throat> 
this would have been in the um, late 60s, more probably the very early 70s. And Muller suggested that, that it become two works. And so it, it wasn't a straight split. Uh, I mean, I've actually compared the, the chapter titles, the chapter titles of, of the books, etc. Um, so the first one came out as the Magical Revival. The second one came out as Alice Crowley and the Hidden God. Now then, um, he did a further book, Cults of the Shadow. Now, at this stage, he would actually refer to the Typhonian trilogy, indicating, I think, that he 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 had no intention at that time. It, you know, he hadn't sat down and thought, I know I'm going to write a trilogy of trilogies. That that really just developed. So then mm. we get um, Night Side of Eden, Outside the Circles of Time, and then Hecate's Fountain took quite a long time, um, part, uh, quite a long time, but did eventually appear. Um, and in the meantime, Grant, Grant didn't have a publisher. He he carried on writing, but the point, but that third trilogy was the only one that he actually sat down and mapped out, um, and decided, okay, I'll 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 tackle that here, that here, that here, um, and so I mean, I personally regard it as the most coherent of the three trilo- trilogies, simply because of that, because he he put mm. the advanced thought into it. Um, I also regard it as the as the be- uh, as the best trilogy simply because in the early days when I first came across Grant and quite a few years afterwards, I thought those early books were the bee's knees. But as the years have gone by, I've got more and more interested um in in the later work in the final trilogy. I see. So I see. Wh- what was your question before that, Mario? Um, his uh, writing process. Oh yeah, writing process. Um, I don't know to be honest because he would never hand anything over mm. until until he was ready, until he'd finished it. Um, I know though that he used to do a lot of writing um, down at the pub. I mean, he once told me that sort of the 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 germ of outside the circle of time had been written. Um, had been written in a pub that I knew quite well. And um, he was a person, actually, that worked from imagination. Um, well, I mean, in a way, that's a silly remark because everybody does. But he, the thing that first strikes you about Grant when you consider all, 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 all of those nine books is how different they are how different they are and um, i mean like say from if you compare the magical revival to the ninth arch you know um yeah you can spot it's the same author a certain style and so forth but you know that that's about it really um his writing process i mean when i was producing the second editions uh, of the books um i would discover kind of notebooks that he was keeping say at the time that he was writing uh night side of eden uh night side of eden or cults of the shadow cults of the shadow was probably the one um that had the most and so he'd make notes in that and try various things out and you can spot some things in there that are word for word you know in in the printed paragraph others were just jettisoned altogether but um i i I suspect that his writing process was just like most people, I think. He would draft something and then he would work over and over and over again. You know, like, say, you draft it, you sort of retype it. I mean, obviously now we wouldn't because we we, we do it in, in, in Word or pages. Um, and so, but back in those days, you know, um, you would, you would type it double space and then you would do further editing work in that. And then you would retype it out, you know, to sort of, to sort of go on to the next phase. That would be, that would be, that would be the working process I should imagine. I see. I see. It's very impressive. I mean, I was going over some of uh, the books I have around Grant's books and just looking at stuff that I've highlighted and everything else. And um, I was just brought back to when I first opened one of his books. Uh, uh, Juan and I, we did a show 
on the night side of Eden. And I was completely blown away. I was like, this is what I've been looking for. You know, honestly, he just is dropping gems and it's so dense. So it's like sometimes I would start reading and literally my cup is full after like just several pages. <laughs> you know, I'm like, there's enough here for me to do follow up research on. And he already blew my mind. And uh, for me, my background is really um I'm really interested in symbolism, basically, just as a study, you know, just across the board, occult symbolism, just, you know, religious symbolism, things like that. And just being a student of symbolism, I get so much from reading his material. It's absolutely wild. Um, But I had a follow up question because you mentioned a name. You said that he um, was in touch with someone named uh, Mueller or a Mueller. Is this W.H. Mueller by chance or is this someone else? (laughs) It's basically uh, my my chuckle is uh, because um, in an email a couple, uh, two or three hours ago, um, I was asked about Polaria. I mean, it's one, actually. That's my but, email, Michael. Yeah, he emailed me about it. And do you know what? I'd never heard of it. And so um, I Googled it and found out that it came out in 1997. Uh, it was, and it was called Polaria the White something or other i can't quite remember now uh by a chap called wh muller um i mean the first review that i read said apparently wh muller is german for kenneth grant and i thought well you know what sort of german linguist would (laughs) would say that because you know uh i should imagine that that wh muller in german means wh muller you know um but i'm inclined to think I'm inclined to think it isn't. I mean, I'd never heard of it before. Um, Kenneth never mentioned it to me um, at all. Uh, but I think what would really put the cap on it is uh, after he died, Stephanie Grant gave me access to his papers. And so if he'd have done Polaria, I'm sure that I would have come across it somewhere or, or at least come across a reference to it somewhere. You know, um, I see. So I personally think it's unlikely. And, I mean, you know, as, as I say, I would I wouldn't rule it out, but I would regard it as as very very unlikely because he never mentioned it, and I haven't come across a reference to it um, anywhere in his papers. Interesting. Yeah, I think whoever uh, Mueller is in this instance was heavily influenced by Grant then, if that's not the case. Because you can tell it's like a continuation, I think, of some of the things that he was putting out there. And just to be honest with you, too, um, one of my main interests with Grant and with things like uh, the Simon Necronomicons and things like that has to do with the Northern Sky, Polaris, Ursa Major and Minor. Um, Grant wrote about it um, as it relates to Set as well and, and Typhon and things like that. So that was one of the things I wanted to ask you about, too. Um, if you had sort of any insights regarding the northern sky, any of these stars or asterisms or constellations up there, and maybe their esoteric sort of uh, significance or value? Yeah, uh, the answer to that is no, I, I'm afraid I don't have really. I mean, as far as Ursa Major is concerned, um, uh, Ursa Major and what you might call the seven major stars, uh of Ursa Major, um, that gets referred to sometimes as the goddess seven or the goddess of seven stars. I mean, that that almost sounds like that Bram Stoker title, doesn't it? Um, Kenneth identified Ursa Major as what what you might call the celestial or constellational um, symbol um, for um, what he identifies as Typhon the primal genetrix. But I, that, that's as far as it goes, as far as I'm aware. Um, I haven't gone very much into it, but what I did do, what I did do prior to this meeting, because, again, it was something that was actually in the email, I did have a quick look through the Typhonian trilogies. I mean, I'm able to perform uh, a search readily enough because um, I've got I've got sort of all the PDFs concatenated as one, so I can just do a quick search, a uh, PDF search on the term. And I did note that every time he mentioned Ursa Major, it it was in connection. It was in connection with Typhon or 
uh, her cow, the primal, the primal, primal genetrix. Um, I did do a similar search on on the North Star. Um, that that wasn't quite so conclusive for me, but uh, that's about as far as my knowledge goes, to be honest, on, on that. I see. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, and I've actually been contacted in regards to that Polaria book by what is being claimed as some secret organization or something other in my emails because the next episode that we're that well the episode i released last week was in regards to uh, the mauve zone and i think we talked about did we talk about the the polaria book and i think we did right yeah we did yeah Mm -hmm. so i think that one's coming out next week on youtube but it came out last week on the rss feed and i've gotten contacted but you know some sometimes some of these and you see it with right pseudo pseudo names in these grim wars or these these magical orders where sometimes maybe they want to reveal more than they actually can and might do it under a pen name but the fact that you had access to all his works after his passing and there is no indication that that's there maybe somebody was trying to you know take credit or attribute that or like a pseudo pseudo grant work, right? That they were trying to take more credit than what it was. And maybe they, they use that name to to get it out there more and, and draw more mm-hmm. attention to it. So uh, that's an interesting find, but I've seen that throughout the occult world. And and to a follow up question to a question that Mario had asked you earlier, how has the world of occult publishing changed since you first started publishing these occult works? Uh, well, there's uh, there's a lot more pe- there's a lot more people publishing now than there were when I started. I think that when I first started publishing, which would be the first issue of Starfire in 1986, it was st- it, it was still it's still in the days that you that you would pass over camera ready copy um, to the printer, and you'd prepare that camera ready copy. Well. I, I used to have a, a brother electronic typewriter to do, it, to do it in. And when I wanted to put illustrations, a friend of mine w- w- uh, would come round and we'd use carpet tape to adhere <laughs> the uh, to adhere um, the illustration into into the space we'd left for it, and then just kind of snowpake or tipex around the edges, um, so that the so so that the edges wouldn't show and of course uh things have changed completely now um desktop publishing things like lulu have made a massive difference you know there's a there's a lot more published uh because i say in the 40s 50s 60s and sort of before then if you wanted anything published you would have to go You'd have to get it accepted by a publisher, etc. Whereas now people can publish. And the other thing, of course, is uh, the growth of limited deluxe editions. Um, you know, coming out the number of grimoires that that come out. So there's there's a great deal more diversity. There's there's I believe, uh, well, certainly restricting myself to the occult field. There's there's more occult publishers than there were, say, 30 years ago, that's for sure. Mm. Yeah, technology definitely does make a difference. I've even used it to uh, to OCR and take the text of books from the 15th, from the 16th century to be then able to put it into an AI translator and you can make models and everything depending on what you're scanning to tailor specifically to that sort of text, right? So the technology has gone a long way, and I and I find it important to, right, not let some of these obscure works uh, fade away with time, right? Because a lot of people, I make the mistake to think that a lot of people are interested in this sort of topic, the occult, esoteric, whatever it is. But reality is, not a lot of people are interested in this sort of stuff. So to no. be to be able to to keep it alive in some sort of way and pass it on for the further generations, I think that's. Uh, that's one of my yeah. things that keeps me going. Yeah, but I mean that. I mean to be honest, that's that's how come it's still around today, isn't it? Because sort of people across the generations, across thousands of years, across the millennia, um, have kind of pre- preserved stuff. 
and you know other people have found it yeah hey speaking of which just real quick um so michael you you had a magazine called starfire right and uh i was lucky enough one of my friends had purchased a copy several years ago i don't know where but uh she has a tendency to find really interesting material kind of out in the wild and she brought it home she's like you got to check out this magazine this magazine's awesome and so i borrowed it i thought it was really really interesting i read some of the articles um it was uh i believe there was a, a big article regarding an unreleased tarot deck that i thought was really intriguing um the artwork for for the deck was fascinating Oh yeah, it sounds to me like that's that the that's a number from the second volume of Starfire. That would probably have been Robert Taylor. That sounds about right. And uh, I was going to ask because I did a quick search looking for if there's PDFs available or if there's anything I can kind of review um, Starfire, you know, issues or whatever. Yeah, I, I came up empty handed. Um, is yeah. there any plan to maybe uh, put together like a sort of compilation of issues or, or republish anything or is the demand just not there? Well, well, basically what I did was uh, it came out in 2010, 2011. Uh, it was... Um, a journal called Ekporosis. And what it was, was it was a selection of articles from the first five issues of Starfire. Mm. Um, unfortunately, that sort of has gone out of print, but um, I would like to keep it in print, actually. So uh, I think really the day of la- physically large magazines, journals, has gone. Um, and I think I'd like to bring it out as a book. Mm probably sort of probably about the same size probably about the same size um as as the books of kenneth grant that i do Mm -hmm. excellent that would be great awesome and i want to focus on this uh freighter akkad here towards the the later half of this episode so we can circle back around to right we mentioned curly at the beginning i know in 2020 you published the incoming of the aeon of mott a collection of his correspondence with Gerald York and others, 1940, 1949. And I haven't picked up a copy of that yet. I will. But this Akkad character, which apparently is coming back, he was, I'd never heard of him, like I said before, I think before the show or during it at the beginning, until you had mentioned him to me. And apparently he had some ongoing war with Crowley. He was also having some downloads, I guess. Crowley didn't like that. But can you talk a little um, bit about this Akkad character? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll I'll just just start out with a very short potted potted summary. Um, he 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 was born in London, nineteen oh nine. You know, again, always interested in in occultism. And then in nineteen oh nine, he came across the first issue of the Equinox. And he wrote straight away to the publishers, you know, wanting to sort of become a probationer of the AA. And um, so he started that uh, under the mentorship of um, of uh, one of Crowley's colleagues called Fuller, Captain Jeff C. Fuller. And then in 1910, he and his wife, they emigrated to Canada and they went to live in Vancouver and uh, Akkad set up, you know, uh, built up a strong, uh, a p- pretty strong and steady OTO lodge in Vancouver. Um, and uh, he was always quite an earnest student. After after Fuller had left, um, he, he kind of fell up directly under the wing of Crowley, as it were. So Crowley, you know, um, kind of rather liked him. Um, but then something odd happened. In 1916, um Crowley had been aware for quite some time that he needed to sire um, somebody to take his mantle, as it were. Um, and, and and sort of at the... In 1916, at the summer solstice, um, Akkad, who'd been... I, I'm not sure what, what grade he had in the AA, but it, it was quite a small one. Uh, he took advantage of this of this possibility within the AA to, to to just whatever you're great, take the oath of the abyss and sort of and sort of declare yourself as uh, as reborn. 
into the third order. And Crowley took this as a sign that Akkad was his magical son because it would actually been trying to sort of produce what you might call a magical heir um, with a woman that he was living with at the time. And for a while, you know, they were pretty close. And then just kind of gradually, I think... I think in one of his letters to York, uh, he summarised it as being, you know, if you're with Crowley, he wanted you to do his will. That, that That's what you were there for, to sort of help him. And he, he'd got his own ideas. And then as the early 20s wore on, um, and Akkad, Akkad uh, joined, the, uh, joined this other order, the Universal Brotherhood, that... Crowley hated for some reason um, and started writing his own books and Crowley thought that there were really bad books etc 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 and um, and then sort of things blew up uh, when sort of Crowley accused him of basically stealing stealing books and um, they sort of had what you might call a financial divorce settlement in 1926, a legal document drawn up called the release. Um, and in 1936, Crowley reopened uh, correspondence because he was preparing the Equinox of the Gods and he wanted he wanted there to be a reference in there to the part that Akkad had played um, in understanding the Book of the Law. And this correspondence between them opened and it was kind of, it was kind of pretty constructive for a while, but then kind of like Crowley just dragged up this whole thing about the books again and, you know, they had an almighty row. And that was that, that was actually the last contact that they had. Um, well, effectively, you know. And um, so that's about it. And then and basically uh, a few months after Crowley died, um Akkad in 1948 declared the incoming um, of what he called the Mar Eon. And that sort of after that was the Eon of Mar that we more commonly know. But that wasn't just a fanciful idea of his, actually. It, it all stems like, like much did with Akkad. It, it, it all stemmed from the Book of the Law. In the third chapter of the Book of the Law, there's a reference to uh, the Eon the eon that, that's to come next. And uh, it, it's quite interesting. Crowley wrote effectively two comments on the Book of the Law. The old comment um, that was published in, in, in Equinox 7, I think, and the new comment, the, boat, the, the foundation of which he laid in Chefalu. And in the old comment, he says, he says um, this next eon, it might be 500 years from now, it might be 10,000 years from now, because time time is not there as here or words to that effect and um and for some reason Akkad decided that 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 this was really really interesting work that he should do preparing the way for this next eon and um i, I kind of think it's quite i mean now in Crowley terms, we associate eons uh, as being tied to the, to the procession of the equinox so that they're kind of just a little bit more than 2,000 years apiece. But in those days, Crowley hadn't actually arrived at that. I mean, like, say, in 1936, in their correspondence, you know, um, when Akkad had said, well, you know, I feel much more inclined to play my part um, the Ian of Mar. And that would have been the opportunity for Crowley to leap in and say, well, you're kind of dumb, aren't you? Because it's because it's more than 2000 years away. But he didn't. He didn't. And if you go all through Crowley's work, you do not find a reference to the 2000 years or the 2000 plus years until after this 1936 correspondence. Uh, certainly that's as far as I've been able to determine. And uh, I've asked some pretty high up people in the OTO about this, you know, people who've got reference to, um, to loads and loads of uh, unpublished material 
by Crowley. And nobody really seems to know. It's just that it's just that by the end of the thirties, um, that's when it that's when that's when it creeps in. So that's it's it's crucial to understand that really because for instance, um at the time at the time that Akkad um detected the incoming of the Mar Ian uh, later uh, later the a bit later on the Ian of Mark with York at the time. And so, you know, he, he said to York, well, he announced it's incoming. Uh, 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 and York was staggered. You know, uh, I've actually seen the letter with Gerald York's annotations on there. You know, this is the next Theon, and then say 20 exclamation marks, etc. But but sort of uh, when 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 Akkad and Crowley parted, um, Crowley hadn't Crowley hadn't gone to this 2000 year model, uh, tying the eons to the procession of the equinoxes, processions of the equinoxes. So, um, yeah. Why I like, why, why I like Akkad and, what, and, and why I feel increasingly drawn to his work is that he was essentially a mystic. Um, the best way I can explain that is um, the word Thelema, somebody, I, I came across a reference uh, once, maybe a couple of years ago, that the word Thelema um, is um, a Greek term that's pretty archaic, but it refers not to the will of the individual, but to the will of God, um, i.e. the cosmic will, if you like. And I just kind of sense that all the way through Akkad's work. And it's, you know, it, it's something that I really, that I really get from Crowley. Does, does he ever say exactly, so you said he, the, the book of, of the law was where he got his inspiration from. Was that correct? Did he ever say he was being talked to by something else or? No, no, he didn't. I don't, I don't think he worked that way. Uh, I mean, for instance, in 1926, he claimed to have detected a work, um, a word, ma- uh, manio, which he said was uh, the word that Crowley failed to hear. Um, hmm. And for a long time, for a long time, I wondered how Akkad had actually derived that. You see, the problem, the problem, if you're trying to find out all this sort of stuff about Akkad is uh, sort of after his death, for a while, his papers were held by the Universal Brotherhood. Um, but then um, they were sold and resold and resold um, sometime in the 1970s. So it's very, very fractured now. and It's very difficult to get, get a handle. But I think personally that, that this word would have just emerged into his consciousness, into his awareness. Uh, just as, for instance, in early 1948, um, the word ma- the, the import of the word manifestation emerged into his awareness. It, it's a word that opens and closes. Uh, the first, it, it's in the first and the last chapters, the first and last verses of the first chapter of the Book of the Law. Um, and you, you can, of course, see the connection, can't you? You know, the word monio in 1926 and manifestation in in early 1948. You can see that something is emerging, is emerging in his consciousness. I, But I don't think that he ever claimed or even intimated that that something was being transmitted to him from outside. I, I've I, I've not come across that so far. And Mario, do you want to add something? Yeah, just real quick. I just think it's really interesting um, the Aeon of Maat, and this is perhaps you know something we can unpack at another time or whatever. But uh, the feather of Maat is the feather of truth, and she corresponds greatly with Libra, and so the first five words of library is Libra. And uh, the feather of Ma'at 
even literally shows up um, on some covers of the Book of the Law. It's embedded in the pillars, on the two side pillars. And so even the concept of law very much corresponds with Libra and Lady Justice and all of these different sort of ideas. And so even as you're just kind of explaining things here, I can see the Ma'at symbolism in the Book of the Law as well. And uh, like I said, that her main sort of icon, if you're going to pick one, is the Feather of Ma'at, which literally appears on the Book of the Law itself. So anyways, there's lots of fascinating sort of symbolic threads regarding uh, the legal system and even like literature and like, um, you know, the written word and things like that and Libra and Ma. So just wanted to point that out. Interesting. And this this idea of this magical air, right? This idea that he, he was wanting to have somebody did did did. And from your experience, Michael, did anyone ever fill this role of taking over for Crowley as some sort of magical air to continue his work or what are no, your thoughts on that? I don't think they did. I mean, I mean, sort of what he did um, was Crowley. I mean, in about, I don't know exactly when it was, but his friend, his German friend, Karl Germer, spent some time in a concentration camp um, in Germany. Uh, I think it's because um, the Nazis were kind of uh, keeping a close eye on on sort of Freemasonry and allied organisations because you know there's always been this idea you know that sort of that sort of that part, that. Freemasonry has a partial aspect of people that are just waiting to uh, take over, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he he came out of that. And when he came out of that, Crowley decided that that he, Gurman, was going to be his successor. I think I I, I think personally that that Cro- that that for Crowley, Gurman was was an immediate choice, a stopgap choice. I mean, he was aware, you know, that, that sort of Gurma wasn't much younger than him and sort of wouldn't be around for that much longer. And Crowley did identify um, at least two uh, young men that he thought that had got potential and, and, and actually told them so. Um, so, no, he didn't really have the sort of the sort of successor, the sort of heir that at one time he was thinking that, you know, he would have. He did actually father a child or thought he'd father a child in in late life. Um, but that guy wasn't really, he wasn't, re- wasn't really an heir. In, in fact, I, I think that it, he was a bit sort of simple-minded, basically, unfortunately. Because he also referred to Parsons as his son too, right? In correspondences, if I'm not... Well, yeah. I mean, basically, Crowley was very enamoured of Parsons at one time and worked quite hard uh, manipulating things behind the scenes um, to get rid of uh, to get rid of this guy, um, Smith who'd headed the Agape Lodge in California Mm -hmm. and have Parsons there, have Parsons there instead. But he soon grew disillusioned uh, with Parsons um, because, you know, Parsons was a sort of pretty excitable person, a bit of a butterfly as well. He would, he, he would leap from, from sort of one thing to the next big thing. And then um, when he, when he sort of fell under the spell of Hubbard, uh, mm-hmm. for instance, you know, and wrote to Crowley in excited terms uh, about about this chap Hubbard that had turned up, you know, and and sort of how they were sort of uh, working together to sort of bring through um, an elemental, you know, he sort of decided uh, basically at that stage he wrote Jack Parsons off. You know. mm-hmm. Yeah, that that's an interesting story there, and the the elemental aspect of it because this magical sun, magical air. I've also seen H.P. Blavatsky. Uh, I don't have the names of the people she accused of having 
children uh, on these other realms and these other dimensions, essentially these magical, almost like moon children. And then you have the idea of right we, towards the beginning, we talked about interacting with with entities outside of space and time, maybe perhaps elemental in nature, right? Because I know Crowley wrote about elementals and having sort of uh, vessels for these elemental entities, such as a homunculus, moon child, et cetera, et cetera. And I came across, and I don't know if you can speak on this, the the ritual of the OTO to marry an elemental. And there was some talks about that at one point because my next episode that I'm putting out, uh, I thought I'd do a simple episode on elementals, but it turns out that there is a very deep, deep rabbit hole when it comes to this topic of elementals. And they had allegedly talks back and forth about uh, these rituals that they would do in order to have intercourse with said elementals. And I don't know, do you, do you know anything about that, Michael? No, not really. I mean, I mean, sort of, as you were talking, um, I thought I could recognize, um, the odd reference to, um, one of the papers in the later degrees of the OTO, which are kind of all about sex magic, seventh, eighth, ninth um but then then of course there's been there's been a lot of other stuff um done for instance uh there was a book that was published while crowley was alive i think it was published in the 1920s the name of the woman escapes me but it was all i, th- I think it was called heavenly bridegrooms and that was kind of all about you know having sort of a having a sort of ghostly husband or, you know, something like that, it would sort of fit in to the sort of sort of areas that you would go that 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 you were making reference to there. But no, I don't do much. I I don't know too much about that area personally. I'd uh, crowd. I certainly tried it. And and the reason I also bring this up is because I believe it was in, in the mob zone. I think Grant refers to Ledbetter and somebody else also conceiving a moon child. I forgot the guy's name. It was like some guru that was supposed to take over for them as well. Yeah, that was um that was a reference to how um they'd chosen some young Indian boy mm-hmm. to be the next world teacher and they sort of groomed him up. Um, in fact, I can't remember who the guy's name was now. I mean, yeah. I don't think it was Krishnamurti, was it? No, but, no, it was some weird name. Yeah, because it, it wasn't yeah, even... some some weird name. But that didn't that sort of that didn't come about um, by sort of some m- mysterious sexual process with. Um, with other forces, etc. Um, I think that Ledbetter and the people around him just kind of came across this child. Um, mm. Might have been in, in an orphanage, but I, I don't think so because I've also heard reference to the boy's family um, as well. But certainly, he was being sort of groomed as a world teacher, um, and Crowley. One thing, I mean, round about that time, um, speaking of moon moon children, that's my moon child there, Doctor. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Basically, I I mentioned when I was talking about Akkad that he joined the Universal Brotherhood, and Crowley seemed to dis Crowley seemed to have a a a deep dislike of what he what he regarded as rival organisations. Um, and B, B, he saw himself as the world teacher at, at one time. And I mean, like, say, he did, he, did, he saw himself as being Blavatsky's successor and that he would actually take over theosophy. Um, this is, I mean, this is, this is, around about the time of the Blue Equinox, um, he was public. He was publishing in the Blue Equinox um, a commentary on Blavatsky's Voice of the Silence, and he actually said several times to Arkad um, that when this came out, it would cause it would cause such an explosion in um, in Theosophy that he would be recognised as the successor 
of Blavatsky and anointed as successor. You know, and you read that and you think, wow, how deluded are you? <laughs> Do you seriously think that's going to happen? But, you know, but it's just that in those times, um, there was kind of expectation of world teacher and people wanted to be world teachers, um, et cetera. I mean, the, I mean, the, the kid that you're referring to that, that, that led better than others anointed, um, he actually renounced it before very much longer you know he said no and just sort of went his own way yeah i can't i don't think i'll be able to find it but it's somewhere in beyond the mob zone where he where he talks about that i found it interesting that when you, know, you mentioned this akkad character and i had uh, looked a little bit into him i saw that it was like some sort of magical thing going on and i've done uh, deep dives on the moon children and all these different rituals and uh, lately the the my focus has been this elemental aspect of it so i find it super super interesting that they also do that but how can you talk to us as we wrap up here a little bit of right because you have curly who wants to kind of be everywhere all at once right wants to be the main guy or saying wants to be this world teacher but how does somebody like grant what was he like what was it was he uh, you know his personality what was he did you ever interact with him you know uh, oh yeah yeah in an open I setting mean, Yes, yes, I did. Um, I mean, I found him uh, a very, a very warm uh, and generous person uh, with a very, a very dry sense of humour. Actually, very sort of British sense of humour, if you like. And um, I liked him a lot. Uh, he was, he was very reserved. You always had the impression that he was just revealing to you what he wanted to reveal of himself. Um, to you so he was he was he was a very private man um he did have a few flaws he could get paranoid uh quite readily you know you know i would add i i've yet to come across anybody who doesn't have flaws um but i i liked him a lot i used to have these conversations uh, i mean at one time i would go around about once a month to study and we were there for two or three hours by appointment it it, it, it was only ever by appointment you know you you quickly got to realize that you shouldn't even consider the possibility of just turning up on spec and um we would sort of discuss order affairs and so forth for the first part and then for the second part you know just having just having various discussions and i was just starting to get interested in advaita vedanta at the time and we sometimes you can have a discussion with somebody and it strikes you as so profound that you feel as if your brain is going to burst do you you know what i mean and um so i i i used to have these um you know I used to think, well, (laughs) I don't know where you are, but I'd like to be there. (laughs) And, um, yeah, I liked him a lot. I liked him a lot. But he took his work very, very seriously. You know, um, there aren't many jokes in his work. And, you know, that is a measure of how seriously he took it. Very seriously indeed. And quite rightly so. Quite rightly so, you know. His work really is something. But like I say, it's something that grew because, um, because like, say, there was just going to be three, four, five, and then, you know, and sort of it wasn't until the third trilogy that he actually sat down and and mapped out what he was going to do. Um, And kind of like a bit of you thinks that, gosh, wouldn't it have been good if he could have done that, you know, right from the outset but of course he couldn't because because a person writes something and they're changing along the way you know so every book by Kenneth that you read is so different but it's not to be wondered at I mean every book by Crowley that you read is is so different and I mean uh, considering that it's 30 years between the publication of the Magical Revival in 72 and the ninth art in 2002, if somebody hadn't changed, hadn't evolved, hadn't developed over the course of 30 years, you'd kind of begin to wonder really, wouldn't you? Yeah, they were, they were going through some alchemical process, if you will, right? Like some internal change. And 
Are there any writers today, esoteric or occult, that you, you know, uh, are drawn to their work or would recommend? Do you recommend anyone else's work other than Grant? Um, I'd recommend the work of Andrew Collins, actually, um, Psychic Cresting, um, etc. I mean, you know, I will declare an interest. Um, he has been a friend of mine um, ever since... Uh, ever, ever since I got married in 2004, because uh, my wife um, had been a member of his team, as it were. And so so I've got to know him very well. But he's got a very, very creative, um, very, very, very creative and imaginative uh, body of work. And, and that, too, is changing all the time. And it was... I have to say, I often think the main differences between Andy and myself uh, is that sort of I'm interested in in sort of in sort of in sort of getting, if you like, to the root of consciousness, and he is working similarly, but doing it, it with him, it's become trying to find out uh, when consciousness essentially started historically you know so you know he'd sort of like to go back and back and back um but he also he pays a lot of attention to what he picks up in in what you might call his, his psychic researches so you know he mixes the two and if there's been a change over the years i think that he's gradually become more rigorous um in in sourcing his material in, you know, in, in kind of, you know, he won't just have an insight and, and sort of, and sort of write it and that's it. Uh, he'll jot it down, but then set about trying to validate it through various other things as well. You know? Yeah. That's how, that's how I conduct research as well. It's, it's very intuitive, right? You have to, I, I like to feel the way through and then I like to wherever it takes me, whatever, whatever it is, right? Like we're all still trying to figure out the same thing. Is there any particular work in, in specific that you would recommend of him, of Andrew Collins? Um, well, not really. Um, his first work was the black hole chemist. And really, I think you'd need to really start with the first and just go through it. And, um, it would be a Google search would really take you to um, sort of a list of uh, what Andy has had published over the years. All right, cool. I'm writing it down. Just I always like to check out other people's works too. And uh, what you mentioned earlier about Grant, where you see the transformation from his first work to his last work, it's like also another another thing with Grant is that he re references his other works within the work that you're reading. So you have to go back and then check out the other thing. And it's like, you know, to further understand it, I developed it completely in X, Y, Z books. So you have to be jumping around. And, and that also, that makes it difficult for me. And one of the things that I struggle with is I'm reading these works that are associated with people in these groups, if you will, right? Societies, whatever. And sometimes I feel like I might be overstepping my boundaries by putting out works in relation to something that people are part of for their whole lives really, or is their lifestyle. And then here I am some dude on the internet researching it. Cause I find it interesting putting out videos of it. And I, we did a video on the night side of Eden, which got some attention from people in the order or whatever it is that they were claiming in the comments. And then it was funny cause I did see it. I saw that same video posted on Reddit under the, I think it was the one of their subreddits. I forgot what subreddit it was, but I was like, there's somebody, you know, they're they're paying attention to somebody who's not even in the order to interpret these works. And that's kind of scary for me because it's like that's why I tell you, like, correct me if I'm wrong at any point, because I, I'm, I'm still learning and I'm taking this stuff a lot, a lot of times for face value. And right to the uninitiated, it looks like one thing. But for the initiate, it's something completely different. You know, I would sort of like to sound a note of caution, actually. Um, about Kenneth's work. Um, with Henrik Bogdan, um, 
well, Henry, <clears throat> Henry Bogdan, a few years ago, brought out a book that we published at Starfire. It's called The Servants of the Star and the Snake. And it's a collection of articles by various people. And in, in each article, the author takes a single topic of grants and writes about it. And, and, and sort of a lot of people don't know how to get into grants. You know, you know, they're, they're quite bewildered by it, and I would always recommend that book because I, I, I think it, I think it's excellent. But uh, to my mind, the best article in there is by Martin Starr, and he refers he refers to bricolage in connection with Grant. He refers, refers to bricolage, and bricolage is actually. Um, what you might call a patchwork fabric, you know, uh, say a fabric woven of many different things and so forth. And I thought that that was pretty good as far as it went. But I think the crucial difference with Grant is that Grant just doesn't pull something into his work. He he actually assimilates it. Uh, like, like, say, um, there are some what you might call spare people who get upset with Kenneth Grant's presentation of spare, you know, because they don't consider it spare as God intended, as it were. And probably, probably there might well be many people out there who are students of Massey and wouldn't actually like Kenneth's presentation. But the thing is that Kenneth, Kenneth never presents anything as a kind of objective study. He was only interested in what can I get out of this? Um, you know, how does this work bear on my own work? How, how can it further my own work? And I actually think it's a very, very honest way of working, actually, you know, because what is the point of just presenting something as objective knowledge? Well, there is a point, of course, because you can inspire somebody to go back to the source and read it for themselves, you know, but I understand perfectly, you know, what sort of, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of Crowleyites, for instance, get a bit upset about Kenneth Grant because you know they they consider that he's distorting Crowley. I mean, I personally don't think don't think he is. Um, and anyway, you know, how could they possibly know that he's distorting Crowley? Because you know, he, Crowley died in 1947. See, when somebody dies, um, the real them just drifts further and further and further away. You know, um, I, I brought out when um, the incoming of the Union of Mark, the book, came out in 2020, which was, uh, as, I, as I said, it concentrated on 48 and 49 correspondence between um, Gerald York and Charles Stansfield Jones. And there was one reviewer. No, there was one person in the United States who who got it. This um, uh this friend of mine over there, I, I won't embarrass him by uh, saying his name, but, but sort of what, what he said was, if you actually want to, um, to, um, to learn, read what it was like for, for people in the, in, in the immediate months after Crowley's death, and they're, they're doing this, that and the other. And that's, that's exactly that, you know, um, after a person dies, you know, I mean, you know, when someone's died, your memory just kind of gradually, gradually changes, shifts. You know, I, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I see somebody that I haven't seen for, 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 for 10 years. And I find it quite startling how much my recall of them has, has just drifted away. You know, because every time you think about it, that kind of changes, if you like, the memory, the memory imprint. So it, it's kind of extraordinary really mm. and th that also applies to places too right when you remember yeah. a place in your mind and when you actually visit there it's completely different than what you remember it as so perhaps it wouldn't have been so bad if you had if you hadn't if you hadn't remembered it incessantly if you hadn't thought about it at all for 10 years then it mm. probably would be exactly as when you saw it previously but if you if you thought about it quite a lot it probably has drifted off mm -hmm. a fair bit Mario? Yeah, uh, I know we're wrapping up here, but um, just with the sort of idea of death and, and you know, just um, your, you know, your actual physical essence kind of drifting on or whatever, but or your work off. still being there. 
Yeah, right. Yes, exactly. Uh, I'm kind of curious. Did Grant, did he feel um, by the end of his life, do you have any understanding on if he was content with his output? Or do you think that there was more left on the table that he really wanted to write about? How enthusiastic was he about the material, you know, uh, before he uh, passed and transition? Yeah, I, basically, basically, when the, when the Ninth Arch came out in 2002, after it was published, you know, uh, I said to him, well, so what's next, Kenneth? You know, and he said, well, that's it. Mike. That's it, Michael. You know, uh, I've done nine volumes. I've done nine volumes in the Typhoon and trilogies. Uh, and that's it. It's up for, it's up to people coming after me um, to do other stuff. And so I said, well, you're a capitalist. You're not going to stick at nine. You're surely going to go for 10. And so, so quick as a flash, he came, you know, he said, oh, that was the ninth arch. Uh, sorry, that was against the light. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he did carry on writing. Um, for instance, uh, he for for decades he'd been working on and off on a book called um, Monolith, um, which remains unpublished. Mm. Um, I think he was pretty content actually i mean sort of like after the ninth arch we then started publishing um stories novels that he'd written over the years actually um and there was at the feet of the guru which was a collection of basically a collection of articles on mysticism that he'd written it, well that had been published um from 1953 onwards in indian magazines um yeah i think he i think i i think he was content i gotcha michael don't leave us high and dry what's monolith about can you talk about it is it ever going to be published well i mean obviously i've read it um i was expecting something like against the light actually um he was always he, he was very enthusi- enthusiastic about it for a few years. Um, and I think all the way through his career, cause I, the first reference to Monolith, I came, I, I came across in, a 19, in a 1959 pocket diary. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was quite startled by that. I think that it was a kind of vision of the ultimate that would be, or, that would be always beyond him. Although I think they always are, because because partly because your idea of the ultimate is changing all the time. You know, ever sought, never found. You know, you sort of get to where you think is the final thing, and it's not. You just get onto the next horizon, etc. And I think it's a never-ending process, personally. And so he never he never passed it over to me um, to publish, and it wasn't finished and. Uh, I think really, you know, that's in essence. It's really it. It's it's all about um, it's all it's all about a person person's interior um, interior monologues. Really, you know, um, I'd need. I mean, I've read it through about two or three times. I'd need to read it through again. Um, I think. I mean, I've got a very high opinion of it, but then again, you know, that that's because. I think there's a lot of advice of a dancer in there, actually. Mm. I don't know, Michael. I think you might be a little bit biased too, right? To the to Grant's mm. work. <laughs> so, oh uh, yeah, but it, yeah, but if I were to publish it, um, it would need to be a reconstruction, and yeah. I'm not I'm not sure that that isn't a bit impertinent, you know. Mm. It, and and that's something that right when it comes to the the core the, the original intention of the author uh, in my studies of alchemy that's something that, that comes up right the original intention of whoever drew that plate up or whatever it was or whatever work that they were working on the original intention versus the interpretation later on of people uh, there's two colliding ideas there and and it can really get. Uh, kind of hairy, right? Because you start uh, projecting things into the work and interpretations into the the yeah, artwork exactly. that was never right. supposed to be there. You know, no, that's right. It has to be done very, very carefully. Indeed, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Michael, can you plug again? Where can people find your work? Let me pull up your website here: Starfire Publishing. 
You were great. I really enjoyed this. And I'd like to have you back on again to talk about the mob zone and get into some more of these uh, grant. Uh, how, how would you say grantian or or uh, how, could, can we can we make a word up for that? Like these some grant topics. Do, some people do say grantian, actually. Grantian topics. So yes, it is a term. OK, awesome. Well, good. Uh, so, yeah, I want to get into, you know, peel apart some of these uh, these topics with, with you who had first. Uh, right uh, firsthand accounts and experiences with grant himself and maybe further develop them a little bit yeah right. love to so starfire publishing.co.uk you can find them on there michael you were great i really enjoyed this and mario you want to plug anything before we get out of here uh you know you guys can always find my stuff at symbolic studies.com uh michael thank you for your time i really appreciate it and I uh, just want to say thanks again, too, for making these works available. Um, oh, pleasure. Th- they are scratching an itch, um, a-, a deep, deep itch. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. So I'm really enjoying them. Okay, good. As always, everyone, catch you on the other side. And thank you all so much.